you know, I'm gonna be a principal when I grow up, but a little bit about the quality dynamics of higher education and really what does that mean when we talk about quality. Sorry. Okay. Um, and so I would yeah, go ahead and guess that everyone in this room knows one person or two who stopped out or dropped out of college um, or university. And it would probably still be the majority to say that you know everybody knows at least five people who have probably done that in one way or another. As we think about quality, we know what a board certified doctor is, and we know how to find certified organic or at least healthy food. But what does it mean to have a certified or a quality education? And so I'd like to talk about how are we conceiving and conceptualizing quality within the higher education context. Does it mean we're actually learning in the classroom, or does it just mean that we finish our four years, or six years, or eight years, and we just have a degree in hand? What is it we actually mean when we go into a class and we leave and finish it? And so I started into this discussion when I was fresh out of college. I had a degree in opera, very employable. <laughs> and my first supervisor handed me a task to think about how we were converting credit hours from a two-year degree into a four-year degree and how that actually reversed the four-year degree dynamic. And so in this conversation, as we're thinking about what it means to get a university degree and what it means to a quality university degree, I just want to expand our thinking a little bit about who the key players are and what makes the degree equitable or quality. So this next slide is an adaptation of a research framework saying there's three main entities that have a say in this. It's the public, policymakers, parents, grandparents, anyone, the government, and the colleges and universities. And this isn't always an equilateral triangle. For the most part, we think it's the government telling colleges and universities what to do, saying you have to do this, you have to enforce this, you have to be telling our students this. And that's not entirely the framework. You can talk to my husband, lawyer, or someone with the specifics on why that isn't. But basically, the government hasn't yet said we're going to control every university. And colleges are quite fond of this. Universities in this country, since the 1800s, have really wanted to maintain their autonomy. They've wanted to be in control, and that's how you'll notice the difference between K-12 education and universities. And so we have this middleman called accreditors, which is my passion. I hope it's yours, but it probably isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was write a dissertation on it. But it's also state agencies, and they're the ones that are really interacting with institutions, telling them, hey, you're falling short. Hey, you really aren't doing what you should be. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about what this middleman does and how they're helping us with this accountability discussion. And so as we think about accreditors, where do they get their power? If you've been watching the news recently, they've probably been talking about the Higher Education Act. You know this because if you've ever applied for FAFSA or a loved one has student loans, those student loans happen because of our friends, the accreditors. Accreditors have their power from the government and they also have it from the institutions. The institutions actually play a role in shaping what accreditors ask for. And so why are institutions selling accreditors? Institutions have to report to them like a student reports to their teacher every week. Every time they call them, they have to answer like a responsive child to, well, the teenager or something. Um, and so things we can tell. Institutions are reporting their numbers. They're saying who's graduating, who's dropping out, who's taking all their money. And then we're sort of wondering, well, what can't you tell? There's a lot of things that don't boil down into a statistic. If you've ever taken a class, you know that numbers don't capture everything. So things that we can't tell are what's happening in between. Someone can have a really awesome experience at Stanford, and someone can have a really awesome experience at IUPUI. It's really hard to report that to a state agency or an accreditor. So we're working on capturing, how do we talk about learning outcomes, and how do we talk about what you learned in that public speaking class that changed your life, but not the person next to you. And so as we move to this next slide, you can see that we're really having a complicated conversation on like who's telling who and who's in power, and as we as a country are having a discussion about dropouts and about high costs, what are we using to define quality? And so while I'm hoping to dedicate my life to this research, I'm hoping that all of us can think a little bit more about this equation where the costs of higher education are skyrocketing. I mean, everyone probably knows some of the tangling amount of student loan debt, but then what's the value of a degree? Is learning always captured in degree? I know some brilliant people who just skip the whole college equation, and I think they're marvelous, and they've done fantastic things for this world. And so as we return back to think about college dropouts or people you know who stopped out, maybe there's still room in the discussion there. Maybe we can talk about quality and learning via MOOCs, or via alternative credentialing, and different frameworks. And I think this is my slide that doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so as we think about the completion goal that is ever on our minds, um, what should I have? <laughs>